Okay, team, I'm excited, really, really excited about our interview today. We've got Courtney Van Scoy in the house. Courtney, good to good to have you on. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for inviting me to be here with you, Mark. You know, I've looked forward to this for a few days now, and I'm excited that we're talking about intentional leadership. It's an important topic, and hopefully I can share some perspective. I certainly want your listeners to know that I am not the expert in leadership. I'm still learning along with everybody that's listening yeah. today. And so just really a pleasure to be here and help. Yeah, absolutely. And I look forward to having the discussion with you. So mm -hmm. opening question, everybody gets, Courtney, what does it mean for you to be intentional? You know, I the word intentional, I just think about that word. And, I, and what comes to mind for me is on purpose. Mm -hmm. And in agriculture, so for 20, almost 28 years, my career has been in agriculture, working with several of the majors, I would say. And the one thing I've noticed over the years is just how complex agriculture has become from, you know, it's not just a product you put in the ground and maybe something to spray for weeds. You know, there's all these digital elements. There's all of these, you know, new business you know, models that are being brought to the market. Um, there's all the marketing decisions. So it's complicated. And so when I think about intentional and I think about on purpose, when when I'm leading my team or, or I'm leading even a project or group of people, I always default to um, what's the what's the one or two must execute activities or projects in this initiative, because it's so easy to get distracted with everything going on. I mean, especially I look at my company I'm in right now, you know, there's just the way we could get distracted with all the initiatives and just the balls in the air right now. I think it really takes someone being intentional to say, as we look at the next 30 to 60 days, here's the two things that in order to pr make progress, we've got to accomplish. And so that, and then along with, you know, so prioritizing those one or two things, but then the other thing is just regularly communicating and giving feedback to the teams regarding how we're doing on those two things to keep everybody laser focused. And for me, that's, that's intentional. We're doing things on purpose a couple of the, just the big rocks we're attacking. You bet. And I want to unpack that a little bit because there's mm -hmm. a couple of things that we've got, a couple of buckets that we've got going on here, right? One is the the overall complexity that we see in the industry today, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of complexity, a lot of information, a lot of startups, a mm -hmm. lot of new products, a lot of interesting technology, right? Out there that that's, that's available. And it's really easy to potentially kind of get caught up in the clutter Mm -hmm. of all that complexity. So the thing I heard you say was, what are the one or two key things that we need to keep checking in on and keep moving forward with with right now? I'm curious what you're seeing in the, uh, in the events that you guys are producing, the trainings that you're putting on, where are you seeing sellers and, and, and people in this, in this space get kind of hung up in that complexity right now? And what's important to keep them focused on so they can move forward? The biggest hang up that that I see when I talk to our sales organization, you can almost always backtrack it back to unclear expectations. Mm, there you go. And so it's one thing, this is a tough balance, Mark, you know, in, and it's one thing that I'm working on right now as a leader is I want to give my team and our like our sales managers want to give enough direction so that we feel like expectations are clear. But um, the generation that we're leading right now really wants a you know flexibility and they want to have some independence and they want to be able to be creative decision makers and and it's you know it's a struggle it's a challenge finding that right balance but. As you think of, as you, as you ask the question around managing this complexity, I think we as leaders have to figure out a way 
to be super simple and super clear with what needs executed, but then allow for that creativity and how they get their work done. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's, there's a lot to weed through, especially if you have somebody who's less experienced. Yeah. So they need the guidance, right? They need to know that they're on the right track and and be recognized and rewarded uh, along the way. It's actually, you know, that's why I started coaching as originally it was kind of a side hustle. So I wanted to be a speaker and and we, we, I was teaching a, a program called Managing Across Generations. And a couple of GMs from some retail locations in North Dakota, when I was on tour up there back in like 2013, uh, approached me and they said, hey, you know, nice presentation. Thanks for teaching us about generations in the workplace, et cetera. L- but listen, all the stuff you're talking about, coaching and feedback and, and, and clarity and all this stuff, listen, I don't have time. And I looked at him. I said, "What do you mean you don't have time?" He, and he looks at me. He said, "Well, I mean, not only do I get, do I got to manage these kids." And he points to these couple young guys sitting in the back row at the event. Yeah. Not only do I got to manage these kids, right? I've got a, I got a, I'm in charge of procurement. I got five other guys that I'm in charge of, and I got to go sell four or five million dollars worth of crop inputs myself. I don't have time. And I looked at him. I said, I, "You don't. I don't. Where do you find time to do that?" So that's part of the complexity that we're talking about yeah. here, right? Yeah. That adds to it. Because, and this is tying into the second bucket, which is how do you create clarity? How do you make time for that? And that's actually when I started offering coaching as a service, because I recognize that busy leaders sometimes don't have time to do that. And we've, Mm -hmm. you know, since then, as the story goes, we've logged over 10,000 hours of coaching since that time as a team. And uh, that that's, that's where I find just a lot of people really struggle is like, how do you create clarity? How do you yes. guide them? And so I'm, I'm just, do you have any, any things that you've picked up on in managing maybe that Gen Z, younger millennial group, uh, Gen Y, whatever. We're, I, I get, yeah. I even get confused and I wrote the program years ago. So, <laughs> so what, what are you noticing at works? To, especially I'm thinking of somebody's listening. That's got yeah. a 25, 26, 27 year old. That's a, potentially a really good high performer, but maybe struggling to get clear on next steps and keep them engaged. Yeah, I love that you brought up clarity, and especially with the generation, the, the a little bit younger generation that that we're leading currently, and, and it's and it's a challenge. But I will, you might chuckle at my answer because it's just so simple. Is um, I, have you read the book Extreme Ownership? Of course, I think uh, it's definitely the most common book that's been brought up on the podcast yeah. and all the Is interviews it? for sure. Yeah, hundred oh, percent. Okay, so we um organizationally, it's the first time we've all sort of read a book together and and talked about it. But I bring that book up because there is one concept in that book that for me was a light bulb moment and, and has made me way more effective around this area of clarity. And they talk in the book about, of course, we all know it's the U.S. Navy SEALs and, and really their leadership principles that they um, follow. Mm-hmm. But the one skill they talk about, and it's kind of buried deep inside of the chapter on, um, I think it's in De- decentralized command, mm-hmm. but they talk yeah. about a read back. And um, in, in, in our sales training, we teach that exact same principle, but it's called discovery agreement when we work with customers. And essentially it's just a moment where, I mean, we think as leaders, you know, we've just laid out, you know, a new project plan. And we think we just had all the questions answered, I's dotted, T's crossed. But then, you know, when we take that next step to say, what did you, out of everything we've talked about today, what did you hear that is most critical that we need to get working on as a team? And you actually have them read back or state it back to you. And I know it seems really simple. That's something you're going to laugh at me. But I have found that doing real informal readbacks and with, with customers, when you're uncovering some of their business needs and opportunities, have them restate back, you know, what, you know, you summarize, have them restate back confirmation of that, that we're on the same page is really just a great step that often gets overlooked and and it can impact that clarity. Yeah. I really like that as a tactic and I've read the book Mm -hmm. and I think, I mean, I'm I'm sure I've read that, but hearing it stated Mm -hmm. as a management tactic, 
That's really cool. I hope you guys yeah. pick up on that because just having them restate it to you. And, and it, I think this is maybe one of the number one frustrations I deal with when I'm working with leadership as they're looking at bringing us on is like, just like, they just don't get it. People are just yeah. not, they're not following through. They're not getting it. And it always comes back to those unclear or clear expectations. Mm-hmm. Right. And this is yeah. where so much of the frustration and so many of the stories that get spun up in the workplace come from someone who thinks they set really clear expectations, Mm -hmm. someone who did not clearly interpret the expectations, whether they were given clearly or unclearly. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it just creates a, just a, a, you know, a relationship storm. It does. And that's, that's the beauty of utilizing intentionally utilizing Mm -hmm. that readback tactic, because not only does it then, you know, so if you if you've talked through some details of a project plan and you've asked your team, go, you know, go do, but before you, you dismissed them, you had them restate back what the ask was very often, you know, you find as a leader, there were a couple of key elements I missed based on their read back. And so you can address them so that when they walk out the door, you know, they, that they know exactly what we're trying to accomplish as a team. But the other really cool part of that is, um, and this also kind of goes back to the book, Extreme Ownership, is it it reduces the likelihood that if they maybe don't um, achieve their target or hit a timeline or, you know, accomplish the goal that was set out as part of this, this plan, they can't say, yeah, but you didn't tell me that, or yeah, but I didn't understand that I was expected to do that because we've had this agreement. We had this read back. We both agreed. We understood. I said, you've got it. You said, you've got it. And um, so it really eliminates some of the finger pointing. Right. Yeah. It should eliminate or at least reduce the amount of excuses. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. No, that's great. Okay. So that was one question and we went deep on that one, but I think if someone showed up and listened to this episode today or watch this on YouTube, like that was one really key thing that will save you a ton of headaches. So I'm glad we spent some time there and talk to us a little bit. You get to look under the hood of a few different organizations. I'm sure you've been a part of a few. What are you seeing is working in your space around attracting and retaining good talent? We know everybody's struggling with it. What's, what's working for you? Yeah. Retaining good talent, attracting and retaining good talent is is always a leadership challenge. The one thing, and I'm a little bit biased, so you'll have to bear with me on this, but the one thing that I believe is most important for organizations to really keep their best people is to ensure that you're giving them a regular cadence of opportunities to learn and grow. And, you know, I, you know, I've worked within several different organizations. I've worked under several different structures. And when I say, you know, are you investing in your people? Are you developing that talent? Because if you're not, they will leave. And what I'm, What I'm not saying is, are you sending them to a, you know, a conference once a year? It's not that it's saying, you know, are you, are you, when you roll out a new marketing program, for example, are you spending time practicing? Are you spending time ensuring that they understand exactly how to message that to the customer or to the retailer? Are you ensuring that they don't just understand the details of the programs, but they are really confident around how to execute it and do it well? So it's that's the one thing I'm really excited about here at Bear right now is we've built out a development team and structure that allows us to make learning and growing a part of everything we do. So it's connected to the business, which is super powerful. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing is, you know, beyond just traditional learning, you know, organizations that help, you know, their, their best talent or their highly promotable talent find the right mentors, you know, maybe get involved in the right, um, project assignments that might give them some some cross-training across different functions and departments. 
you know, things like that to really show that you're investing in your people are so critically important. And when business gets busy, and unfortunately, sometimes those those experiences go by the wayside. And that's why people start looking, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I want to go back to the the beginning of your answer because you used a really cool sequence of words, and I like words, so I'm always listening to different how they kind of, how they kind of land in my ear, right? And you said a regular cadence yeah. of learning opportunities, mm -hmm. and that was really cool when I see when I hear regular cadence, and this is something I coach people on as well. Is what's what's your cadence for coaching? So having conversations with your people, this should not be accidental. This should be intentional. What's my yes. cadence? What's the cadence within which I work actively to create the environment within which people can thrive, yeah. right? And, and so when I heard you say the regular cadence of learning, I wanted people to real. I want to draw back on that and make sure that people pick up on that. Yeah. Because let's, let's just be honest. If I'm talking to most of you leaders who are probably listening to this right now, you're completely unintentional and probably uninformed about how to create a great cadence for learning. Mm -hmm. I don't think that I'm probably too far out of bounds in saying that for most people, because this is not something you were taught. This is now a reality mm -hmm. that you're going to get to create if you want to have a great culture that retains its people. Yeah. But that's not necessarily something you learned in your agronomy classes or even a, or even a business management class that you might've taken somewhere. Nobody talks about this at the university level. It's something we have to learn through trial and error. And you and I, in the course of our career, get to be in the learning space yeah. a lot. So obviously we see it and we're biased, but here's something to tie it back. And I just want to highlight the importance of what you said, because what it means, uh, what uh, I stole this from Tony Robbins years ago, it's something called the six basic needs. Okay, and there's six basic human needs. Don't have time to train on all of them, but one of the six okay, is growth. Mm -hmm. When I when I talk about need, I'm not, I'm talking about like you need this stuff, like you need food and water and shelter. Yeah, okay? yeah. these are things that we have to have. Otherwise, if we're, if we're if we're not getting them at the place that we work on a regular basis, then we'll go find them somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is a really important one that you're talking about. It's literally one of the needs. So if you're structuring a management program, I would I would include what are the growth opportunities, mm -hmm. right? And and don't go halfway on these, <laughs> right? Yeah. Make sure that you really, you know, a, a lot of times when I'm selling training, I'll be honest, Corey, you know, a lot of companies have, they're like, well, we don't really know what we should budget for this kind of thing, mm -hmm. which tells me they don't have a budget for it. Yeah. So we then, we have to position, they know they need it, but there's, but it's not a line item that they look to, to know exactly what they would spend on that every year. Right. And so we have to set the market for them, but it's an interesting experience. A lot of them struggle with. So it mm -hmm. is. And, and, um, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because when when companies are saying you know I didn't budget for that or what's that cost or what's you know to me that sounds like they're thinking that it's some sort of three day training workshop that you're going to send your people off to and that's that's not that's not where learning that's especially now back to our generational that's where that's not what lights the fire of people in the workforce today that that traditional classroom training now occasionally you may not be you might have to use that platform to get people up to speed on maybe mm -hmm. some new technology or like in our case a new trade or something and you might have to bring them all together in classroom but but learning uh, much of what's what we're finding uh is is working is that right and i and that's why i said regular cadence is really peer and leader coaching a real a real a, you know open coaching culture where we all feel like we're accountable to help everybody else grow and develop and that's something we're trying you know we're working on that here i'm not going to you know claim that we've got that figured out mark but it's something that we're working on here so that it's not just your manager or the train the training person that comes in to develop me, but I've got really great leaders around me that are giving me great ideas and feedback and serving as a sounding board and sharing advice. And so coaching in in kind of the learning space is more important now than ever. Absolutely. I could not agree more. All right, Courtney, I want to get to some of these other questions. This okay. is fantastic. Just this, these two things by themselves in, in summary, honestly, are, are worth listening to this podcast for, in, in my opinion. I mean, we're, we're going back to how to, the importance of clear expectations versus unclear expectations, uh, the idea of the readback. 
in order to do that? How do you create more clarity for your people? Talking about this, this cadence of coaching, the cadence of learning opportunities. What it, to me, what it means to be an intentional leader is you're, you you get to go take a few days, go off the grid and think about what kind of culture do you want to create within which your people can grow. Mm-hmm. I would love it. In fact, I think we're going to start just offering opportunities where we block off like a nice Airbnb and we invite a few leaders in and that's the coaching program. That's the new program for those people. Cause otherwise they won't do it for themselves. Right. <laughs> we yeah. just get them off the grid to do some planning, share what we're planning and support each other. I think that's a great program in and of itself. I'm working yeah. on that one. Uh, but let, let, let's talk a little bit more about you. So what's been interesting for you? What's uh, in, in, in your leadership career, what's been a big hurdle that you've had to overcome? Probably one of the most recent, but I, I've had a lot of big hurdles that I, that I've overcome, but the most recent one is, you know, I, I, I talked earlier a little about my, my team and how I, Bear has allowed us to, to build out a team that puts a learning professional in each sales region, but it wasn't always that way. And for the first seven years I was here, we had a very centralized, small training group. So it was me and like two other people. And, you know, we'd try to fly people into St. Louis or we might have a location, you know, Gothenburg, Nebraska or wherever we might be going. And we would pull pe- people together for a, a workshop. And for seven years, I was meeting with our senior leaders saying, while this checks the box for, are you developing your people? It does. But if we really want to drive behavior change, it's got to be embedded in the regional leadership team. It's got to be customized. It's got to be just in time on the topics that matter. And while they would, for seven years, Mark, they would agree with me, they would nod their head. But when it came to, you know, going to HR to secure the head count, it was, there was always a budget constraint. There was, we need it. We got to fill these sales positions first. Well, about probably three or four years into me making this appeal, I even had sales managers and some of our regional leaders saying, Courtney, I will give up a sales headcount to have somebody in region that can own this development of my team, help ensure that we have more timely resources and, and, and really be the quarterback of learning. And, you know, so I heard that. So then I go back to leadership and say, you know, they're willing to forego a sales headcount to make this thing happen. And Mark, it wasn't until we had kind of a, a change in command way up here and, and our head of sales, uh, the new one came in who had a very developmental mindset and recognized the importance of talent, keeping talent, growing talent has to have a very, um, prescribed and regular development plan. And that's when I finally got the nod that we are moving forward with your structure. So my, you know, it's, it was one of the biggest hurdles is to get past the, yeah, it sounds like a great idea, idea, Courtney, and you make a ton of sense to actually putting, you know, the dollars into this thing to make it happen. And, and sometimes it just takes someone who sees your vision and understands, um, people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a great story. I and mean, to stick it out that long, right. Yeah. And, and, you know, face rejection after reject, it's a great yeah. sales story. Right. But that's yeah. in many cases, I believe uh, also what it, what it takes to be able to create real change yeah. inside of an organization, especially a large organization like that. Yeah. Right? And what's been really rewarding is, you know, I have, I connect with our regional um, directors, pretty regularly, at least quarterly, if not more. And every one of them have said in, in one year, as I reflect on the year, we've been at this for about a year and a half, actually, but as they reflect on having a, an exclusive regional training lead in the, in region, in field with them, they're like, I don't even know how we did it before having this resource. So it's really been cool to see. 
Mm-hmm. That's that's amazing. And then one of the things that I was thinking on as you were talking there, you went from a very centralized structure to more of a decentralized structure, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's that takes a very uh, intentional leadership mindset to look at going about it that way. Because how do we, especially in a large organization, but I mean, I would this could be a 250 person organization, let alone a 2,500 person plus or whatever, but uh, how do you how do you give uh, permission? How do you create this space? And this is not something we have the answers for always, but how, how can we be intentional enough to see that that need is there? Because people's need for learning, people's need for growth, uh, their their willingness in some cases to contribute to that is much greater than we ever think about. And and if we're not there with those just in time, which is one of the the words that you use when those just in time resources, the just in time training somebody might be asking for it, but now it's two years before they get something and it's too late. Right. Right. And that, and that's why having someone closer to the frontline sales organization that really specializes and owns that it, Mm -hmm. because sales managers, area business managers, you know, and even district managers, they're they're running the business. They're looking at the numbers, the forecast, the tracking, you know, where we're at to goal and this and, and, and they're expected to coach. So they've got a lot going on. And and it's not you you ask, how do you do it? Well, you know, having an intention and a person with the intention of sitting at that table when when the sales leaders are talking or the sales team comes together and they're talking about a new strategy or a new approach to the market and and you've got this person saying yeah but what do my people need to know and be able to do so that that would work and then they're circling back and saying okay well we need to make sure they're educated on these three things and and the sales managers were like i i never would have thought of that yeah. So it's somebody that is just intentionally listening to, you know, the, the, um, it's kind of like, you know, you get in these sales meetings and it's just like squirrel, you know, they're topic mm-hmm. to topic and bouncing around. And there's somebody with the intention of listening on the behalf of the, the skill and knowledge gaps of, of the people who will be asking or yeah. will, will be asking to deploy this technique. Well, this that's technique. the job of a great facilitator. So when you have that person who's out there to, to listen and learn and take that feedback and scribble it down on a flip chart or a whiteboard and then take it all in and distill, that's what your, your frontline sales manager needs yeah. or your yeah. frontline operations manager or your location manager is someone that they can just go to with this and then have that person be the professional who's in charge of discerning what to do with it and have yeah. that be close enough to the frontline where they're still relevant, where a lot of times, especially in large organizations, uh, HR is not. right, yeah. And so HR ends up buying for an entire organization. And, and I'm not trying to poo poo anybody in HR or anything like that. It just isn't yeah. always super relevant to the person receiving it on the front line. Right. So and so actually, maybe, you know, for yeah. your listeners who may or may not have this resource, they might be thinking, oh, that's great, Courtney, but, you know, our organization doesn't have that person. Mm-hmm. But, you know, maybe there is someone that could be, that has an interest in this space that could be flagged as a champion that, you know, they could wear both hats. They could, you know, be their sales manager self. But they're also accountable for listening on that, um, for those development needs and thinking through what would the team need to be equipped with? What would they need to learn? What might we need to make sure they practice before they go attack this project or take this program to the field? So, you know, I think there's ways around it, even if you don't necessarily have the resource like we have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The, the, I can almost promise you in every organization that we go into, actually, I do promise you every organization we go into, there's somebody who's passionate about teaching, training, learning. Yeah. So oh, I, you know, identify that person and, and allow them the fle- the freedom and flexibility to go out and find out what are some of those needs to help you then discern where to allocate those investments. Mm-hmm. Like what, yes. a, what a great opportunity to use somebody. It, it does, it does not have to be a complicated process. Right. Yeah, so exactly. I think we overcomplicate that one. We 
Maybe because we're just not intentional about how to go about, go about creating it. I don't know. So, uh, yeah. Courtney, I, I, I feel like I, I wish this was an hour long podcast so that we could continue on and keep going. We're at our, we're at our time, but, uh, talk to us a little bit about if you would, uh, just vulnerability and, and how does that help from an intentional perspective? How does vulnerability in leadership help to create that, that workplace that we all dream of being in? Yeah. This is an interesting one. And, and I'm just going to tell you, you know, I, I, ref, when I reflect on the last 28 years in ag business, the leaders that I worked the hardest for are those ones that I had ultimate trust with. And, and I'm like, what? I, I started thinking about why do I trust those people? Why, why did I give that to them? And it did all kind of stem back to vulnerability. And they were really open and really honest with me at all times. And so as a result, obviously, I'm very open, very honest back. And so being vulnerable as a leader, I think is, um, it's absolutely mandatory if you want true followership, if you want, especially going back, I talked earlier about a coaching culture. If you want people who look at feedback as really helpful and not threatening, it's got to come from a, a good place, a place of trust. And that's what vulnerability and being vulnerable as a leader allows you to, to accomplish. And so, you know, you know, that kind of, this question made me sort of think back over why is it that I trusted them so much? And it was, it was because they were so open and honest. And it's, you know, it's interesting too, is recently I was, I received some coaching that I was, I had an internal struggle with. You know, sometimes, you know, they always say coaching, you can kind of feedback, you can take it or leave it. You know, some feedback's good and it helps you. And so other feedback, maybe it, maybe it's something you say, thank you for the feedback and you move on. But I was recently coached on, um, we took this leadership assessment. Okay, Mark. And it, it told me that I was a little too high in affiliation and meaning I'm too close to my people. And so one of the action items for me was to lower my affiliation. I've got to get, I've got to be able to set, you know, that close of a relationship aside a little bit to, to have the tough conversations, to make the tough decisions. And, you know, I, I wrestle with that because I can see leaders who are trying to do that. And that damages trust for me. Now, I don't know about everybody else, but that it does for me. And so that that's a time where I said, you know what, I, I, I'm i not going to let that go because being a leader who has a high affiliation for my people, great relationships, close relationships, but I'm, you know, I'm experienced enough, I'm mature enough that when we have to have a direct conversation, you know, if, if I built this, this this trusting environment where I've been vulnerable, where uh, I've I've come forward and led with high affiliation, then it makes that conversation easier because they know that I'm saying this with their best interest in mind. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing vulnerably that experience because that's it's tough to get feedback that sometimes doesn't quite sit well with us, right? That just maybe... Do I, do I trust this assessment, especially when yeah. it comes from an, from an assessment? Because we can we always can pick those apart, right? Right. Uh, and it, but it's super interesting. Like, well, and we have to sometimes make tough decisions as leaders. So, yeah. is it better to to be more of the ice queen in that case and less approachable versus, let's say, the queen of hearts? Yeah. Right. Who's much yeah. more fun to be around? Much I, I trust that person way more, but. Man, like, does that does that prevent you as a leader from being able to to let people down when it comes? Because ultimately, somebody has to make tough calls, right? Mm -hmm. That's leadership. Sometimes Absolutely. we have to make decisions we don't like to make, and that's sometimes somebody gets to go, or decision, or money gets to get allocated elsewhere, or we get to build up businesses in some places and not in others. That's reality. Yeah. Hmm, but it's wouldn't just, you much rather hear some tough news mm -hmm. from? 
that person that you know cares about you versus yeah. the ice queen. And, and it's like why I would. <laughs> it's my, so my wife and I, my wife and I have this conversation commonly. She's, and it, it, it's not like, she's not giving me an ultimatum, but, it, but she will, she'll say like, if you want the ice queen, right. Be cold, right. Don't share, don't be vulnerable with me. Right. right? If you want the queen of hearts, you know, sleeping next to you, right. We, we need it. We need to talk right about these yeah. things, whatever these things are in, in that given context. Right. Yeah. And, and it's, and so I actively am intentional as the husband in this case, thinking about, okay, am I, am I influencing her to be the ice queen by, by treating her this way? Or am I influencing her to be the, the queen of hearts? And that's yeah. obviously I would rather have the queen of hearts around because, Hey, even if it's a tough conversation, I know it's coming from a place of love. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And yeah. so I, I a hundred percent agree with you and I'm, and I'm in your corner on this one for sure. It's just, <laughs> it's an, it's an interesting case. Cause I, I can un- also see where in depending on who's writing the assessment, depending on the culture of the organization, depending who's leading. And, and this is where we got to jump off and, and say, yeah. Hey, I want to do this again and continue this conversation. Cause I think it's riveting. How do you choose what kind of leader to be in that situation? And I'll say this, I think it's an intentional choice. You get to choose as the leader intentionally, how do I decide I'm going to show up based on my personality, based on my experience? Uh, that's something you got to pick. You got to pick a horse and yeah. ride it. So, Absolutely. I Courtney, any more. last, yeah. Any last thoughts before we bring it in for a landing? No, I just, I, I, I've had a great time with you, Mark. It's always fun to talk with you and just explore leadership concepts and ideas. And again, you know, I've shared a lot of my experience here today I've learned a lot of the years. I'm certainly still learning and growing as a leader, um, but really been fun to be here and hope Mm -hmm. everybody took something away from our conversation today. I know they will. Thank you for being here. This has been fun. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Mark.